This is the story of an event that takes place every Memorial Day on a beach in Honolulu, Hawaii. While its roots lie in Buddhist tradition, it is an event for people of all beliefs, from all cultures and all walks of life. It is for everyone who has ever suffered the loss of someone they love. It is an event filled with music, dance, prayer, ceremony, ritual, and most of all, emotions, happiness, sorrow, loneliness, despair, solace, pain, desolation, and peace. And while it is the story of the thousands who participate in the event, we will follow five particular stories. A family that loses its young warrior to cancer. Another that loses its son to war. A man who loses his wife and the children who lose their mother. A woman who loses a dear friend. And a couple that loses its son in a fatal accident. We follow their journey from loss to grief, to solace, and finally to the place where a candle lights the heart. We didn't tell him initially that it was cancer because he wouldn't have known exactly what cancer was anyway. We kind of told him slowly about cancer and what it meant. He wasn't scared, he didn't cry, he didn't scream. The chemo was working and he was doing great. He went back to school. Halloween came around and um, he wanted to go pass out candy to his classmates because he hadn't seen them in a while. So he dressed up as a werewolf. <laughs> he was bald by now. and. Uh, nobody recognized him. But after like a few minutes of him being in the classroom, one kid shouts out, like they're all like, who's that, who's that? And one kid says, it's Ryan. And he takes off his mask and they were all just laughing and they were all so happy to see him and they all came hugging him and he handed out the candy. He was sick, he had a fever. He'd been tired again, and I had a feeling yeah, something was wrong more than just him having a fever. So they do an x-ray, and the x-ray shows that the tumor is back. He just had such a fighting spirit inside of him. He was such a strong little boy. He just amazed everybody. He never really seemed afraid, he just, I think he tried to stay strong for all of us. How could he survive that? How could he just keep having all these surgeries and just, he was so weak at this point. And I know he wasn't happy anymore. So we tell him he's gotta go back into surgery. He says, why? We tell him because this bleeding won't stop and they need to fix it. He says, okay. But I think for the first time I thought 
he might have been scared. I'm taking him down the little gurney in the hallway and yeah, we told him, be strong, stay strong, hang in there. He says, okay. I gave him a kiss and um, thinking that he might not make it out alive. My son's name was Michael. He was a, a what we call 150 mile an hour kid. He was just a bundle of energy. Well, Michael was my number one son. We had this special sense between us. Even from a, a little kid, I could almost sense when he was in trouble or he, when he was in danger. He was 29 when he joined. Uh, he was a realtor in North Carolina. And after 911, he joined the Army. Well, a mother does not want to see her child go in harm's way. That's how I felt about it. I tried to discourage him without dishonoring his choice. And so we asked him for a commitment to examine that for three months before he made his decision. At the end of three months, he called us. He says, Mom, I've made my decision. I'm going to join the military. And I, of course, being a dad, I tried to talk him into going into military intelligence or supply or something safe, and uh, he wouldn't hear of it. He wanted to be a combat engineer. That's, he, he said he absolutely felt sorry for anybody who didn't do that and became the uh, CO's driver, which is a position of a lot of importance. I mean, he was the guy as a PFC who monitored the radio, drove the commander, took care of the commander when he was sleeping, navigated the whole nine yards, and he actually came to me and said, you know, I don't want to do that. I want to stay an engineer. And I talked him into it, and I wish I hadn't, because he was killed with his company commander. ケンさんは友人として親しくさせていただいていました。最初お客さんとしてお子さんがその私たちがやっているハワイでやっているプログラムに参加されたのがきっかけで知り合うことになりました。まあお仕事お医者様なんですね。で海のそばにあのまあクリニックを持っていらっしゃったようなので。津波の警報がまあ鳴られて、まあ、あのスタッフとか患者さんとか皆さん避難させてそれであの一度は逃げられたように話を聞いてるんですけれどもスタッフの方がどうしてもあのお子さんの関係か何かあるって言ってあの戻られ
るっていうことになったっっ逃げれば逃げられたのかもしれないんですが人を避難させてさらにその自分の,あのスタッフの方のことを気にかけて一緒に戻られてそれで巻き込まれたっていうふうに聞いた時にあやっぱり。自分のことだけを考えて行動されるような方じゃなかったんだってあのすごく思いました。Cameron started basketball at age four because he was tall for a four year old. Never made any trouble. Just played a sport. He always liked to exercise and run and be outside. Yeah. He knew that, that NBA would be a stretch. He has a lot of friends that play in the, you know, the International League, Philippines, Europe, and stuff like that. They always tell him that he, he was good enough to play for them.、Mm -hmm. And that was his goal. He wanted to play as long as he could. We got a phone call two、yeah. o'clock in the morning. So I picked it up and he goes, Auntie, it's Kavika. Cameron fell and hit his head really bad. I'm following the ambulance right now. I'm going to Queens. Cameron's not responding. And I was like, oh my gosh. After they did surgery, we kept hoping, scraping his hand, his feet, praying. Steinhoff would not be denied. You know, you're not going to see these guys be intimidated by rejections because there's going to be plenty of them in this ballgame. Even against a player like Steinhoff, squares up on Mins, and Mins stays with it, blocks him with the left hand. Steinhoff again just perseveres through this whole series until he gets to the free throw line. So we waited and waited, and it happened 11 30 that night that they pronounced him brain dead. So we had to let him go. But、um, Cameron lives today. He saved three lives in Hawaii. We gave his liver and his、uh, kidneys to three people here. My mom taught me how to be a woman. Seriously, she,、um, so many life lessons that she would, you know, like、uh, I'd go to lunch and she'd make me school and she'd leave me a little post it card in my lunch every single day. And I would open up my lunchbox and I would get this little card. And, you know, sometimes it would be like, I love you, smile, have a great day, you know? And sometimes it would be like, 
little inspirational quotes, like um, one I remember a lot was, your friends are your future. My mom had cancer when I was in third grade, and um, that was really rough, and she got through that. And she still went for checkups like every three months. It was something like that. Very, very often she would go in for checkups. And I just remember she started, you know, feeling sick again. And we just, we didn't think of any, anything of it, you know. And then she went to the doctor. And I remember one day we we're sitting right here actually. And um, my mom says, you know, I have cancer again. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like how, and you know, I was like 12 at this time, 13. And I was like, that, that can't happen, you know. And then on top of that, they tell me, um, you know, this time it's stage four and um, she has six months to live. And at first I was like, you know, how, how can this happen? You know, I was, I was just so angry and I, I, I regret it now, but I was like, you know, I hate you, mommy. I hate you so much. How could you do this? And I just ran off. And then, I mean, that was one of my biggest regrets. Like, I mean, of course, that's the last thing she wants to hear, you know? And I just, I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. I didn't know what to do. In 2003, she was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. So we, you know, we thought we licked it with the chemotherapy and radiation treatment. And, uh, you know, we were vigilant always with checkups and so forth. And she was doing just fine, absolutely fine. And then uh, it was actually Halloween day, October 31st of 2008, where she was very, you know, feeling a lot of stomach pain. And she, she just thought she had, you know, gastrointestinal problems. So went to the doctor and they did an ultrasound and found a lot of cancer had metastasized to her liver. So it became stage four critical at that point. And we, uh, we made a very tough decision to try and get the best treatment we could and I uh, worked it out to get her to MD Anderson in uh, Houston. And uh, we fought it and we fought it hard with multiple surgeries and, and treatments and we tried everything we could, humanly possible. But they gave us some tough news that, you know, you don't have much time left. I really recommend you get home to your kids and spend as much time as you can with them. Yeah, it was, it was tough. She was in a lot of pain and a lot of suffering, but she really handled it well. There was no sorrow, no self-pity ever from her. It was, it was just, you know, just concern for the kids. When someone in the family is sick like that, you think that you would want to, you know, come closer as a family and grow stronger, but I was the opposite. You know, I, I didn't want to talk. I didn't want to communicate with anyone. My mom and dad would come in and try to, like, hug me or kiss me and tell me they love me, and I would push them away. I'd be like, you know, stop it. And definitely I have learned my lesson now that that was a mistake, you know? I was just so confused, so angry. It was really challenging for them because they weren't sure. They, they just didn't know. And, and if I look back on it, I, I, I might be a little more blunt and, and tell them a little bit more what was, you know, I didn't want to hide anything from them, but you know, I was, you, know you, you listen to a lot of advice and, from different people and you just got to make your own decisions, certainly. And you know, some people say, don't tell the kids. And some people say, tell the kids and lay it out there. The truth is what they need. And, so I, I, you know, there were there were some challenges there, but uh, I, I think, I think they would have liked to have known a little bit more how close to death she really was. You guys are the first in line, huh? Yeah. What time did you get in line? Uh, three. three in the morning. Good luck, have a good time. 3 a.m. Dedication. I was hired on as production manager. A production manager basically does, touches on everything. Just have to know everything about everything, not necessarily 
delving into it and controlling some artistic accesses, but basically everything technical. Generators, the staging, the sound, the lighting, but also stepping past that, I still need to know about art, artists' movements, uh, performances, so I can know how the backup of their tents have to go and everything, everything, all the support. I'm gonna go down, come back. No well, you're not gonna bleed to death, no, or, <laughs> but but I'll I'll get something for you. Okay, I'll be back. TV vans. I kind of wanted them to park up on the hill because then people can sit down in front. But if they park in the front, people can't see if they sit in back. There's a guy out in line. He's bleeding, so. I'll bring it back. Okay, operation. Come sit. There's a surfing accident. Yeah. Salt water is good for it, huh? Yeah? Yeah. Probably heal it. He was deteriorating every. Every dose we did, every new trial, every new thing we tried was just making him worse and worse and worse. And I couldn't see it anymore. I couldn't watch it anymore. And uh, all I could think about was he deserved to be home. He deserved to be back in his house and see the beach and be with his friends. And he didn't deserve to die there. He didn't deserve to die at all, but not there, you know, not in that hospital. I just told him that the medicine wasn't working anymore and we we're going to be leaving the hospital. He said, what about my Make-A-Wish? And right now I just want to go to Disney World. He didn't have much time left. Knowing that when we came home, we were going to be setting up hospice, um, it was rough because you try to enjoy the time there and you try to enjoy the moments, but how do you totally enjoy it, knowing that he's not going to be around much longer? So it was hard. We tried not to cry too much around him, and he passed away July 29th. We sat outside on the patio, and he had his arms wrapped around me initially. I could feel him hugging me, but uh, after a minute or two, well, his arms just fell to the side. I was holding his head against my chest. I didn't really, you know, want to look at his face as the moment as it was happening, but I knew he was going. And I told him that I loved him, and I thanked him for being so strong, and I told him that if he was tired, he could sleep now. He told me that he was having a hard time breathing. He said, it feels hard to breathe. Those, those were his last words. He was waiting for me to accept that, that he wasn't going to be here anymore. And I think the moment I accepted it, I think he felt like, like he could go. These are ash pendants, so Ryan's ashes are in here and Ryan's ashes are in there. When we thought about the place we were going to scatter Ryan's ashes at, this beach just seemed fitting. It seemed perfect because this is the last place he swam was out there in that ocean. The last place he played at the beach with his friends was right out there. And um, We come up here as much as we can and Especially if we're feeling down, we miss him, and we feel like he's here. This is, this is his beach. He's, he's out there. And we'll just, we can just sit there and just talk to him. And we feel like he's talking, he's listening at least. And one of the most important lessons I've learned from him was that not to really be upset about little things or big things, because it's just life. and. You just gotta take it the way, the, way, the way it comes. And he just accepted life as is. And then, I mean, he had cancer. 
he had cancer, you know, but he was just like, okay, well, it's, this is still my life. I'm just going to enjoy it. So I think something really important was just to, just to enjoy life, no matter what. The simple things, the hard things, the rough roads, just everything. And you only got the one life, so just enjoy it. I want to live my life now helping other people and doing good things, and I, I want it to always be in his name because he's the only reason that I get out of bed sometimes. He's the only reason that we do all the things that we do, whether it's helping to do fundraising for pediatric cancers or helping with other fundraisers for other organizations. It's just all always in his name. It was definitely a wake-up call. What happened? So, changed our lives forever. I've seen, what, 2 a.m., 3 a.m., they end up getting in line because they want to get a lantern to write their prayer on. Um, there are thousands available, but it's so important to them. They want to be there first. They want to be there they don't want to. They don't want to take a chance that they're not going to get one. How long are you willing to stay in line? I know I've been here since three thirty, but I didn't know the line. What? Three thirty? Yeah. Where are you guys from? Pennsylvania. From Philadelphia. Germany. And we're from Australia. I'm from New York City. Japan. And I'm from Oklahoma. From Connecticut. From Dana Point, California. From San Diego. From Maine. I don't really know exactly what motivates them, but there's a lot of people. It motivates a lot of people. A thousand, two thousand people. And they get in line very early. We're, we're, we're going to send you that direction. Okay. They're, these guys are not ready. But yeah, you're going down that way. Okay. Down to you. You guys ready? ready. Oh, you've been way. you've been ready for a while. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Relax now. Slowly. <laughs> you guys are, you're the first one. First one. Slowly, please go. Slowly, y'all. There's room for everyone. And um, we're coming to honor a lot of our family that passed. Uh, we traveled 11,000 miles from the Bahamas. It took us 24 hours to get here and um, three legs of flights to come and honor our family members. Only our uh, grandson, who passed away four years ago. He was only, he was only five days old. Yeah, our first grandson, our first grandchild. So it's very emotional. So we thought we'd come and light a lantern and so he's in our hearts and he knows every day. My fiance Anthony, he passed away last year. And if I have a chance to tell him something, I would say I love him a lot and I think about him every day. And I wish I could meet with him, but I know my time is here for now and I'll see him soon. We were told he was very committed to his buddies. Um, People can explain all the reasons why we go to war, but the reason he fights and, uh, and the soldiers fight is, is for their buddies. They, don't, they can't let their friends down, uh, and he never did. Day after day after day, not knowing whether they're coming back or not, and they still go out, and they do their jobs, and they take care of their buddies, and uh, it's just an incredible amount of pride. He went over for about six months, uh, right outside Sauter City, I mean, right in the big thick of it, and uh, came home for a couple of weeks, and we had a, a big party for him before he left and went back, and about three weeks later, he was killed. This is what we call our, our wall of heroes. It's, it's small, but it's, it's ours. My boss's son was an electronic warfare officer on an EA-6B, and, and was involved in the, in the Iraq War. And of course, I, my son was, was in the Army, and we lost him in Baghdad. Um, and then my other son is, uh, is in, on a gunship. One of the things that we did was uh, shoes. My son and his people over there found out that uh, many times the Iraqi children didn't have shoes of any kind. They were running barefoot. And that really bothered them. So we ran a drive to collect used, new, whatever kind of shoes we could get. Didn't matter if it was sandals, flip-flops, sneakers, combat boots, whatever we could lay our hands on. And we shipped cases and cases of shoes 
to Baghdad, and when they found kids in the streets with no shoes, they would give them some. We always shipped him boxes of candy because what he loved to do, he, he really believed that if he could uh, make friends with the little kids in Baghdad and Iraq, that they would grow up to stay friends. And my son, when he was killed, had pockets full of candy. And all the GIs would go out and uh, give the little kids candy and, and talk to them and, and just try to make friends with them. Someone asked me, how can I um, tolerate them going to war? And I told her that all I can do is say to myself that I have to remember they've lived a good and full life and they've already done great things, and they've already touched many people. And if, if something did happen to them, I'd have to be satisfied with that. All I can tell you is it, it, it's like somebody cuts you open and empties you out. There's, there's nothing. Um, you feel completely hollowed um, because it happens like that. One day, uh, you know, your future's all out there, and you have plans, and then the next day everything's changed. So it's, uh, it's, it's devastation. It's complete and utter devastation. This park is heavily used. There's surfers. Today we have a surf contest. Um, there's fishing, there's swimming. Right here is a bunch of surfers. There we go, that's a definite uh, big surf contest, definitely. Any day you can come down here and there's uh, barbecues, picnics, every type of food. Most, most of the people invite you just walking around. Doesn't matter who you are, they just invite you to eat whatever they're cooking. I see a big difference in the normal vendors that you use on a show site. It's you know always about sound lights and doing a rocket show or a convention, but this show is always different. This event is so emotional. It takes you from a high and it keeps you there for an hour and a half. And even after that, you can't come down. It's so exciting, so emotional. I love it a lot. It's great. It's a great event. No matter what company you are, they're always looking for it. Asking, it's coming up, it's coming up, make sure I get on the show, I want to be on the show. It really is like that. And I've been doing this for seven years and I'm the jib arm operator. But my impression of the event, it's, uh, it's very meditative, it's very reflective. I think it's, uh, if, you, if you've ever lost anybody in your life or if you, you, you get you, brings you closer to the people that, in your past, ケンさんはスポーツがすごい好きで、トライアスロンとか、あとあのバイクとかレースをやってられてるということだったので、あの、最後にお会いした時に、ホノルルマラソンがあるから出られたらっていうのが最後になってしまったということになります。最初に主人
ちょっとぐらいは走ってたことがあるからなんとかなってたんですがもう半分過ぎたぐらいからこんなもう走ってないもんですから。体は重くなってくるしそれでどうやらなんか足爪がもう割れてる感じがあってっ背中に「ランフォーケン」って書いてあるのは重く感じるわけですよやっぱり走りたくてもここに入れない人のために走っているランフォー気仙沼気仙沼で亡くなられてる方がいっぱいいる。私はたとえ足が痛くたって一瞬のことだしそれが終わって休めば何とでもなるだけどそういう人の気持ちを考えたらもうとにかくゴールをするしかないっていうふうに思いました靴を縛り直してもう痛かったと思うんですけど途中から感じなくなったっていうか。やっとゴールでやっと約束を果たせる終わる。喜んでたというか言葉がないぐらいやっぱりそのお父さんのために走っただからこのメダルはお父さんのために走ったけど君にって言って娘さんの,あの首にかけてあげて。Many kinds of people who are、uh, from all over the world, and I feel harmony like about the different kinds of people and different like cultures and religions. And I, yeah, I'm just very happy to be here. Half a mile online. We start one gonna be right at this corner,、yeah. it's gonna go out around the reef and hit the beach. And then we're gonna put a secondary line outside for anything run over the first line. We had time to catch them. So you run the line, then you go down the line and you pick up the lanterns and put them in、um, the, the boat? The, the canoes come the canoes. help us.、Oh, okay. uh, we catch whatever goes over and we, when our boats get loaded up, we dump them on the canoes.、Uh, I heard one was like trying to go make a run for it to Maui.、Uh, it it happens, all, happens all the time.、Uh, homemade ones are really fast and they don't have the skeg, so、yeah. right over the line. Those are the hardest ones for us to catch. Every day going home, crying, <laughs> yeah, yelling, you know, trying to figure out why, why, why. It's been different without him. We try to have a, a family without him. We know he's here. It's just not the same, you know? You lose your child. It's just, especially Cameron, he was the most healthiest guy. Never ever thought this would ever happen to you. Live, local, connected at 10 o'clock. This is Hawaii News Now. Students lined up at the Palama Gym for the free helmet handout in honor of Cameron Steinhoff. The HPU basketball standout died last May when he fell and hit his head while skateboarding. He wasn't wearing a helmet.、Oh, it makes me feel good. It would make Cameron feel good. He loved kids, he loved sports. They purchased 325 helmets to give away. Cameron's family pushed for a bill that would require helmets for skateboarders, but the measure failed to pass this session. Very disappointed in it. I, you know, not just because my son, but you know, I see so many accidents nowadays. 
Organizers hope to keep Cameron's memory alive and protect other students by making this an annual giveaway. If we can save one person with, you know, getting these helmets um, distributed or even trying to get that helmet law passed is what, you know, we we're trying to do from day one, you know. Um, just saving one, one life is, is good. Uh, all I remember was getting the phone call at like six in the morning and, you know, mommy's passed away. And I just remember, I was like, just, I hate everyone. And I just remember I went to summer school. I went that day. I got dressed as soon as I got off the phone. I went to summer school and I was like, act like everything's okay. I didn't, you know, tell anyone. I, I wanted to like pretend it didn't happen. And about two days after that, that's when, you know, it hit me. It's like, mommy's not coming home, you know. and. That's when I, you know, really started to break down. Yeah. I wasn't really sad when the news first came in. I was more uh, mad at the world, I guess. But then, like, on the drive to school, it started to kick in. When my mom passed away, I thought it was the end of the world. This has been the hardest experience of my entire life, losing my mom, but um, I honestly have become a much stronger person from it. I am, you know, the, the mother image to my brother, and, you know, I've, I've definitely taken on the role, and I feel like I was forced to mature very early. Me and my dad did not get along at all. We, um, we didn't talk. We, uh, we would fight a lot. We would butt heads. We, me and my dad are so much alike. You know, we're very um, strong and hard-headed, and, um, so we butted heads, and um, it definitely caused problems. I wasn't living at home for a certain period of time. You know, I had to, I had to leave because we weren't getting along. Kids were in such shock by it. I don't think they really accepted it and believed it. It's a little bit of a concern to me. Uh, I think it's because they internalize a lot of it, and their grieving process is certainly still going on and, and very serious. Where are you guys from? Canada. Canada. Oh, the whole group is from Canada? Yeah. yeah. Well, how many of you come to do this? 29. 29? Well, students. And first time, second time? First time. First time. Okay, thank you. We appreciate it. People want to get involved. Look at these students from Canada, a whole class, Japan, volunteers. These are lanterns that get out, put out for individuals. There's also individual prayers on each one, on several of them. You see them as single ones and so forth, like here on here and here and here, all on the sides, it's all individual. That can't make it to the beach, so this is for them. And there's at least 100 on each canoe. Seven canoes, that's 700. There's only so they can walk by them. I actually heard about uh, the lantern floating from a friend, and then my friend said, you should go, no, you have to try it for camera, and you know, it actually will make you feel better. When I was living in Texas, I had seen the event um, on TV. We got to Hawaii and I just, we never made it. Um, after Ryan passed away, I knew we were going to go. I knew we would make it this year. I think it's going to help us to feel closer to him. I had heard about it a couple years ago, and a friend of mine actually uh, um, participated in it last year, and she told me all about it and, and that you really should go, and it would be great for your family to participate in. We don't have a lot of ceremonial things that we do in honor of mommy, because 
quite honestly, they just don't want to. They don't want to go back there. In the beginning, I was just like, you know, what is writing on the lantern, like, gonna do? Like, that's not gonna bring mommy back. You know, that's not um, gonna do anything positive and beneficial for me. I had come to Hawaii because we were supporting one of our clients who is uh, in charge of security for the lantern floating ceremony. And I frankly was not very happy about being there on Memorial Day because I would rather have been home with my wife. Still didn't know what the event was for. But as I walked over, one of the places we had our camera set up was at the, the tent, the request tent. And I saw the, the small sign that explained what the lantern ceremony was about, where it talked about it was uh, primarily for the, for the loved ones that were lost in wartime. And I said, whoa, I didn't know that's what this was about. I have absolutely no idea. Suddenly had an idea that maybe there was a reason that I was actually there. So I got my lantern, and I went out, and I put it together. Um, I'm going to say something about how, you know, although Mommy's no longer here physically with us, that she's certainly here in spirit and her spirituality, and, and we feel her presence always as a family. Hey, AJ, do you have any thoughts that you might want to? I'm just going to write something about how like, we miss her every day, but she's still a part of our lives. Good. Okay. I'm going to take that one, Major. ご家族の悲しみは大きく少しでも力になればと走らせてもらったその年のホロノルマラソン当日着ていた Tシャツのご家族に書いてもらったランフォー券が力をくれてゴールできました。みんな誰かのためにと思うと頑張れる。でも気が
know, you know what we need over there? I know not your job, and I'm going to ask Nina, but i got to get black snowy cover up the... You know, you're not doing that. I'm taking time, I'm taking time right now, minutes before the show starts, to write my prayers to my mom and dad and my uncles. Mike to Alan. Excuse me, mom, dad. Go for Alan. Don't need him, but. Are you familiar where EMS is? There's supposed to be an ambulance in the field, but where? what location are they now? Ten. Everything's good Nine, with EMS? Eight, seven, six. Five. No, I'm trying to get guests into their seat. I'll take all in a few minutes. I'll go check on that. Oh, there we go. Start the show.
今、美しいアラムアナービーチは、スペシャルな場所になっています。すなわち、亡き人々、父母兄弟。友人、愛する人と魂で触れ合える浄土。ランタンフローティングは過去に感謝し、今ある命の意味を知り、希望の未来へ向かう、かけがえのないひとときです。ここ、ハワイをはじめ、全世界で参加されます。皆様はお花、家族の絆でつながっています。私たちは安らぎと勇気の御証しで結ばれた大きな家族だからです。We're all mourning over someone we've lost, you know, and I'm looking in the crowd and people are crying, people are hugging, smiling, laughing. It's just, it was really just, it was great, yeah. I knew nothing about Buddhism or Buddhist ceremonies and what have you. But I never really felt like that's what it was. It was just a ceremony. You know, it was, and it was all done with a huge amount of decorum and respect. It, it was just an altogether wonderful experience. No, you're not alone. I, I don't know how to describe it better than that. It was, uh, it was amazing. In this part of the ritual, Her Holiness rings a bell as another form of music within the ritual. And its pleasant sound is meant to awaken the heart and draw the mind to peace and higher aspirations. You may now release your lanterns. My journey's here. My time with you. I will carry in my heart. Calm your soul and let me go. I have my path. I'm free to go. Light a candle for me, let it float into the sea. May it carry all the memories of you and me. Don't you worry for me, I'll be right here by your side. Light a candle.
the love you hold in your heart helps me feel will never part I'm in the wind and the rain close your you feel me once again Light a candle for me Let it float into the sea May it carry all the memories of you and me Don't you worry for me I'll be right here by your side a candle for me Oh I love you It's forever And I miss you I can feel you so near This isn't goodbye Take this light and my love, shine it bright for all to see. I thank you for loving me. I'm at peace. I'm free to. a candle for me This story I was thinking about it I was thinking about it I was thinking about it but I was thinking about it in the 実際に津波があったところ被害に遭われた方たちにそのまますごいつながっていくような感じがしてそう思ってふっと置いたらスーッとその海の外に向かって滑るように行ったんですね。ケンさんには力をもらった灯籠っていうとあの亡くなった人を忍ぶとかそういうイメージですけどもすごい力強いものを感じて。あの灯籠を見ながら自分が力をもらった感じすごくしたんですけど私は。I went out into the water and I'm standing there with all these people and I put my son's lantern down and just watched as it, it mixed with all the other lanterns. As I watched the lanterns go out, I 
All I can tell you is I felt a little lighter. If you lose a child, you're never the same. There's a huge weight and sometimes it just crashes over you like a wave. And all of a sudden, the depression hits and, and you're flattened. And I have not, frankly, felt that since the ceremony. I'm definitely going to take my wife back because I want her to share that experience. I, I wasn't really telling him goodbye, but I was letting him go. Maybe we were holding him back over the year, and that signified us letting him go. I didn't want to let Cameron go, like he says. I don't want to let him go. But there was a part of me that felt like he did and said, thank you, you know, I'm OK. But I can't let him go. I, you know, it's just I still have him. As the lantern was floating away, we actually said goodbye. And so it was actually a better feeling than I thought we would have. I knew I was gonna cry and I knew it was gonna be emotional, but I thought, I guess I thought I'd be sadder. And it actually was a good feeling to go out there and see all the lanterns and see all the people there that have lost lives. And it was comforting. I enjoy my job and what I do, and it's great when it's during this event because there's all that extra that I get out of it by the peacefulness. I don't get all this other peacefulness from other shows. If I'm in a conflict or some other problem area in my daily life, this might pop into a more peaceful mode because of this event. I love you, Mommy. I hope you get this. At first, I was, I didn't want to go, you know, I was kind of like, I don't want to, you know, let down my guard and show all these people my emotions. Because all this time, you know, I've been trying to push back those feelings of sadness and losing Mommy, you know, it's always like, just push it back, be happy, put a, put a smile on your face, you know. It's like, uh, don't let them know you're hurting on the inside. And giving the lantern, it was just like, like, just putting down my guard and like, it was just very uh, coming together and it just, it felt really good. I have to say it definitely uh, made me like a little lighter, I guess. Things are definitely turning better now, you know. We've all, the three of us, dealt with our problems and we're slowly moving on from it. I send this lantern to bridge the vast ocean that separates us. I send this lantern to let you go. And yet, in sending it, I now feel closer to you than ever before. For by sending this lantern to you, I am with you, in your heart, always and forever.
out there for research, then maybe Ryan would still be here. <laughs> He made 21, he lost his license, and then decided a week before he passed to um, be a donor. I looked at his driver's license, and he had changed it to help someone out there, which I never thought I could ever do, because he was such a good kid, a strong kid, a healthy kid, always exercised. And I knew that he would be able to help someone, not for myself, but for him, because he wanted to help others. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to celebrate our heroes with us this morning. Alicia Catherine Kalei Hiva Hiva Johnson. I remember the last thing she was saying to me was that she was sorry that she wouldn't be here for like my prom, my graduation. And like I just felt so bad because she felt guilty for this and I just want to tell her like she's been with us this whole time. Even though she hasn't physically been here, she's, she's been with me and my brother and, and my father through everything. And um, she's she's given me so much. David Worley, be at peace now. Uh, you'll always be missed and always be remembered, so thank you. You are a huge part of our family. Um, I know you guys were just dogs, but we think about you guys all the time and we miss you very much. Sergeant Kingman, um, Sergeant Wright, Sergeant McNabb, Sergeant, Sergeant Kwiatkowski, and Sergeant Zimmer Zimmerman, you've never forgotten. You'll, you'll always live in our hearts. And we have days like today to celebrate your life. Mom, hopefully you're proud of me and what I've accomplished. Dad and I miss you a lot and think of you every day. We hope you like the flowers on your grave every Saturday and I'll be sure to keep you proud of me in heaven and shop for the, for the both of us. Dad and I love you bunches. I wish you a safe and wondrous journey, hon. Love you. You'll always be remembered, um, taught me a lot, and I'll always respect that, so thank you. I'll always remember you, and you were so important in my life. You helped shape my life forever. We'll see you one day. I think about you all the time, and I love you. I'm really happy that you're not suffering and hurting anymore. I miss you a lot, and I love you. We miss you, we love you. Thank you, Mom. Arigato. I love you so much. Shukriya. I miss you, Jimmy. I love you. Ikhau Vanya. Just miss you, and I'm always here for you. Ani Tem. 
will see you all soon. Dante. You'll forever be in our hearts. Merci, Merci beaucoup. beaucoup. Thank you. And I miss you.